Hey everyone, my name is Juan Sandoval and welcome to the class. This is uh, an introduction course to model one of cognitive type. Uh, there is a model two, which is still in development, but we're not going to be talking about model two right now. So model one describes a physical phenomenon in the form of body mannerisms, and these are viewed as running parallel to Carl Jung's psychological types, as he called it, and therefore have the potential to independently verify uh, Carl Jung's typology. So today we're going to explore what that parallel looks like. I want to start this series with a few quotes from Carl Jung, just to get a sense of what his position was on all the material we're going to be discussing in these videos. He says here, character is the individual form of a human being. Since this form is compounded of body and mind, a general characterology must teach the significance of both physical and psychic features. The enigmatic oneness of the living organism has as its corollary the fact that bodily traits are not merely physical, nor mental traits merely psychic. The continuity of nature knows nothing of those antithetical distinctions, which the human intellect is forced to set up as aids for understanding. Uh, this is taken from Modern Man in Search of a Soul, and uh, Jung here is explaining the distinction between body and mind as being something that humans contrive of our intellect, a artificial fabrication. And he says that we do this because we can't fathom the totality of it in our minds. So it helps us to think of these things as separate when no organism in nature really separates out these two parts. He goes on to say, the distinction between mind and body is an artificial dichotomy, an act of discrimination based far more on the peculiarities of the intellectual cognition, that is, of humans, than of the nature of things. In fact, so intimate is the intermingling of bodily and psychic traits that not only can we draw far-reaching inferences as to the constitution of the psyche from the constitution of the body, but we can also infer from psychic peculiarities the corresponding bodily characteristics. The word I like most in this passage is far-reaching, uh, because you know few people would say that there's no connection between body and mind. Few people would say they're completely separate and there's no overlap at all between body and mind. And yet, the kind of affirmations we might hear people say is, sure, you can tell a couple of things about someone's mind from the, their body's expressions, but, but not too much. But that is not the language Jung chooses to use. Instead, he says that the intermingling of body and mind is so intimate that we can say an incredible amount about the mind based on what the body is doing, and vice versa. He says here, the psyche is still a foreign, almost unexplored country, of which we have only indirect knowledge it is mediated by conscious functions that are subject to almost endless possibilities of deception. So here, Jung appears to be lamenting the incompleteness of our knowledge of the human mind, which he did a lot in his work, if you read Carl Jung. And uh, he knew that we were experts at lying to ourselves, despite the fact that we are still, you know, one of the best windows into ourselves. So the irony here is that... Um, you might want to argue, well, we're the best source we have for our for what's going on in our minds, and yet it's a very bad source. So there's a problem here. But he also provides a solution to this problem in the next passage. He says, um, this being so, it appears safe for us to proceed from the outer world inward, from the known into the unknown, from the body to the mind. There are any number of paths leading from without inward, from the physical to the psychic, and it is necessary that research should follow this direction until certain elementary psychic facts are established with sufficient certainty. There are several statements surrounding this passage, and I encourage anyone to read the full version. It's uh, incredible to see his view on this point. Jung understood that we have a far better handle on the physical of the known 
and that we could more easily explore the mind from the starting place of the body, so an outside inward. Right? He saw this was possible because he understood the intimate connection uh, and the interdependency uh, between the two. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to explore from the outer inward unless the two actually do correspond to each other. This is, in essence, the core philosophy of a voltologist. A voltologist is someone who studies the mind by the systemic examination of body expressions. So uh, many people don't realize that voltology is not at all at odds with uh, Jungian philosophy, uh, but it's in fact, you know, the most natural outgrowth of his work. It's uh, what he would have loved to see if only psychology and technology had been more advanced in his age. Carl Jung, and he says this around the same passage, that he, he lamented that psychology as a science was so young in the 1920s when he wrote this book, uh, so much so that the even the elementary facts of the psyche had not yet been well established. Uh, and sadly, that it still remains the case today. And I think that is something that can be remedied if his initial proposal for, the, for a solution uh, is actually followed through properly. So, you know, if people dedicate more time to systemically charting and mapping human behavior outside inward, we may actually be able to establish some fundamental, some elementary facts that can act as a cornerstone from which to build more and more, just as we need to in all sciences. So let's focus on establishing those elementary facts of the mind-body connection. The title of this lecture is called Introversion and Extroversion. And for those familiar with these terms, um, you'll know that they were coined by Carl Jung around 100 years ago, and now they're perhaps the most pervasive typological distinctions that there are. Uh, almost everyone has some idea of what they think it means, or have at least heard of a variation uh, of this dichotomy. But since their introduction by Carl Jung, in the early 1900s uh, into popular culture, uh, they've accumulated various and diverse definitions, uh, so many, in fact, that uh, it would take an entire different lecture series just to explain the evolution and the bifurcation of a Jungian typology uh, since the time of Jung to the present day. Uh, but for this lecture series, we're chiefly going to be discussing Model 1's definitions of introversion and extroversion. And we'll be leaving aside uh, other definitions of introversion and extroversion uh, for now, and we'll address them at the end of this video. Of the many things that Carl Jung said about introversion and extroversion, I wish to start with these. I think these phrases cut at the heart of all of it. Uh, they're important because it's from this focal point, this seed, uh, that the other more anecdotal behaviors uh, become tacked on uh, as secondary and tertiary effects. Uh, and here's what that uh, core says. Extroversion is an outward movement of interest towards the object. The object works like a magnet upon the tendencies of the subject. In another passage, he says, the earliest sign of extroversion in a child is his quick adaptation to the environment and the extraordinary attention he gives objects, and especially to the effects he has on them. So what we're saying here that in extroversion, there's a, a movement of the self towards something as if it's uh, pulling you in magnetically, and there's an attentiveness to the object. We'll talk more about what the object means here, but for now, uh, we see that there's an influence from the object on the subject, and the subject seems to be move towards the object. Now let's read the other side. Introversion is movement of interest away from the object uh, to the subject. It looks, as one might say, as though all life energy were ultimately seeking the subject. Uh, the introvert is not so forthcoming. He is as though in a continual retreat before the object. He holds aloof from external happenings. So now on this side of things, we have a situation where a person is in a perpetual withdrawal, a shrinking away, a removal, uh, a distancing from the object. And, and uh, 
seeking the subject, seeking uh, the self. Now, I want you to notice that already here, in Jung's own definition, there is an implicit reliance on the empirical facts of the individual and what they're doing. Uh, he may not state it that way, but that is how it plays out in any meaningful sense. Uh, how do you know if a child's experiencing a magnetic attraction to an object? Uh, well, you literally see him or her chasing it or going after it. So, Or you literally see their eyes fixated uh, on the object. Uh, you know, they'll touch it, they handle it. These are physical facts that can be observed. And uh, this is what it means in a practical sense to witness extroversion and introversion. Carl Jung understood a type to be a, an objective fact of personhood, uh, but he did not systematize uh, what he observed in a quantitative sense. And that's okay, you know, that's what we're doing here today. So we're gonna do that job for him. So this is a famous statue. Uh, the original is located in Paris. It has multiple copies that have been distributed around the world. So it's a very iconic uh, statue. And the statue is variously called the poet or the thinker or the philosopher sometimes. Uh, it's seen as a universal uh, symbol of uh, deep inner thought or contemplation. So if, if, let's say, if you saw this man and were asked uh, which of these two terms, introversion or extroversion, you know, the ones that we just looked at, uh, which are here on the right and left side of the photo, which of these two terms best applies to him? Uh, which would you pick? Uh, most likely introversion, right? Why? Well, because we can physically see his retreat from the object. Uh, the hand drawn inward, like this. Uh, the downward gaze, uh, the disconnect from the world. Uh, these are all physically embodied by the statue. Uh, and these things matter. Uh, it, because it's a statue, it, it has no interiority. It's communicating by its, uh, its posture, literally. It, it's all it is. And so the, it matters that the hand is brought here. It matters that he's looking down. Uh, it, it matters to the, to the message which the statue gives off, which is Again, the thinker, the, the poet, uh, the philosopher. There is an association there, and it's not a, just a contemporary one. It's, it's not limited to a contemporary idea. It's something that we know from observing people. Uh, this is uh, a long-standing uh, symbol. So I want to start with this because sometimes we're not conscious of what we know. And I want to bring that into consciousness so we can move from there forward. So this is something that we already understand, uh, but just not in a quantitative sense. And we need to move to quantification. Uh, so what about these two individuals? Uh, here, instead of a statue, we have real people. Uh, and again, uh, there is, like in the statue, there is a magnetic retreat from the object towards the subject. Yeah, notice the hands are folded together. The, the, their gazes are disconnected from the environment, going downward. Uh, they're keeping themselves aloof from their surroundings. Remember that, that's exactly what Carl Jung said. Uh, this is an expression of that. Uh, probably moments like this are what the statue is based off of. So the meaning of this posture here in with these two individuals is very intuitive to most people. Uh, when you see a person like this, you might uh, go up to her and ask, uh, what's on your mind? Uh, what are you contemplating? And you ask that question because you understand by their voltology uh, that they're engaged in an internal process and they are removed from the external world. They're not paying attention. Literally, their attention is gone from the external world. And we can, we can quantitatively say that by the eyes not being engaged. Uh, they are so they are leaving the external world behind for an internal space, and here we see the opposite. Uh, we see an engagement with the object. Uh, the object here being the interviewer, which is off screen, but we know that they're there. Uh, they're you know maintaining connection, uh, eye connection, but also gesticulation, uh, voice, 
there's multiple ways of connecting, not just eyes, uh, but they, they're attentive and animated. Uh, and their bodies are in a state of constant motion rather than ceasing motion and kind of reserving energy as we saw with the other two. So I've just supplied you with a physical definition of introversion and extroversion. But that begs the question, uh, do these physical differences mean anything about the psychology of the people who have them? Well, th that is the right question. And we will know if they do correspond to psychology, if they allow us to make those far-reaching inferences about psychology. If we see a lot of other data correlated to these physical movements. So if you were to divide people by these physical properties and they allow you to predict a lot of other things about their psychology, then we can say that it's a meaningful category. Uh, and indeed, uh, that's exactly what happens. Everything from uh, career occupation differences across these two, from uh, interests, habits, lifestyles. Uh, in our research, the data clusters itself around distinctions made by these dualities. So we know that they're meaningful because data organically clusters itself around the, these dichotomies. If you want to look at this in more detail, you can go to cardiotypology.com and photology.com. We're doing some pilot studies, which we've published there. So let's return again to the matter of establishing elementary facts. Uh, we need to codify this knowledge and bring it out of the qualitative uh, realm into the quantitative realm, uh, which is what Carl Jung uh, did not do and why um, his theories have not progressed as much as they could have in the last 100 years. So how do we do that? We give uh, precise uh, physical definitions of what we're talking about from the outside in, exactly as Carl Jung said, in order to establish some elementary facts. In essence, the physical definition that I just provided for extroversion can be called proactivity, proactive. It's characterized by proactive motion. Now, proactivity is the physical signal set that I just described as extroversion. And for introversion, we'll call it reactivity. So that's reacting. It's the opposite of proactivity. It's characterized by an absence of outward motion, but a kind of wait and see. And when it happens to you, then there's a response. So proactivity as a physical signal set uh, correlates to extroversion and reactivity as a physical signal set correlates to introversion. So here we see an individual with their eyes disengaged from the environment and their hands retreating from it. Uh, we can then come forward and state that this person is psychologically disengaged from the environment, right? Uh, if a person's eyes are not able to see the environment because they are in fact closed or diverted, uh, the person cannot be said to be visually attentive to the environment. This is a very straightforward uh, empirical observation. Uh, likewise, if their hands are retreated from the external world and kept away from the world, uh, we cannot say that they are engaged with the world. Uh, so this is very tautological, right? Likewise, by definition, when a person is physically engaged with the environment, uh, they cannot be said to be disengaged from that environment. And so here we have a solid empirical foundation from which to form definitions. This is the capacity to establish some fundamental facts. So now that we've established the terms that we have, uh, let's imagine a person who spends 90% uh, of their time, like what we see here, in this physical posture, in this uh, voltology. And let's say they wanted to say of themselves, I'm an extrovert, um, I'm constantly engaged with the environment, I'm a very engaged person. We could categorically call this into question because according to the definitions of introversion and extroversion that we established, we can see that this is not the case. So this allows us to counteract um, what would just be a sub subjective reporting with an empirical definition. And you can say, 
um, by this definition, no, you're not extroverted because we can see that you're not extroverting according to what we mean by that. If we consider that synonymous with proactivity, uh, you're not extroverting as your default mode of modus operandi. Likewise, if we come across somebody who 90% of the time they evidence this physicality here, this ontology, uh, with the animate engagement, but through the eyes and the hands and the voice, but they wanted to say of themselves, I'm an introvert, uh, and by which they mean I'm constantly disengaged from the environment, I'm a very removed person, uh, we could categorically call us into question as well, because we can see that this is not the case. Uh, according to the physical definitions that we've just outlined. So we can measure the proportions of these two expressions, these two modalities, and we can see which one of the two they are most weighed upon. This is, this is very valuable because it gives us another window of information uh, outside of the subjective account of the patient. So this is not meant to be a replacement of subjective report or the subjective factor of the patient, but it's meant to be a complement to it a kind of uh, external checkpoint against the subjective testimony of the patient. Because as Carl Jung said, uh, we are subject to almost endless possibilities of deception. So what I want to propose is uh, simply this. Psychological insight plus photological insight is greater than just psychological insight alone. When we take the body into consideration, along with the mind, we are in a more informed place than if we took the mind into consideration only. Uh, the second part of this talk is devoted to executing these principles correctly in a therapeutic setting. So how do we properly take vitology into consideration? Like on the ground, when, when you're at the office with the therapist, how does the therapist do it properly? What is proper vitological practice? Uh, I'd like to proceed with another quote from Carl Jung, where he says, Every human being possesses both mechanisms, that is, introversion and extroversion, as an expression of his natural life rhythm, a rhythm which goes, surely not by chance, described physiologically in terms of the heart's activity. A rhythmic alteration of both forms of psychic activity would perhaps correspond to the normal course of life. But... Outer circumstances and inner disposition frequently favor one mechanism and restrict or hinder the other. One mechanism will naturally predominate. And if this condition becomes in any way chronic, a type will be produced. What Jung is saying here is that introversion and extroversion oscillate with each other, like the heart's rhythm of blood going out to the extremities, systolic, and back into the heart, diastolic. However, when it comes to uh, introversion and extroversion, the balance of these two poles is frequently skewed in one direction. And we're going to see what that looks like in the following video. So here we have a video of an introvert. This is one of our generous volunteers. Uh, this clip is 20 seconds long. Now what you see here on the top right corner is a little flashcard uh, that shows whether or not uh, the girl is introverting or extroverting at a particular moment. So pay attention to that flashcard at the top. And here, I'm going to play it. Conspiracy theory. Um, I'm not sure that I'm the type to believe in conspiracy theories. Um, Cause I can see how people can get sucked into the idea. I'm gonna play it one more time. This time, pay attention to the two little circles at the bottom, which represent the eyes, and uh, pay attention to how those two circles or the eyes either uh, drop downward or come up and connect with the audience. Conspiracy theory. Oh. Um, I'm not sure that I'm the type to believe in conspiracy theories. Um, because I can see how people can get sucked into the idea. So, so as you saw, the girl was alternating between going into herself with a downcast gaze and then coming outward and connecting with the audience. 
When she's asked to think of a conspiracy theory she thinks is real, which was the prompt for this, she momentarily goes into herself to reflect on the answer. And in that particular moment, she is introverting. She's not present in the external. But then as, she, as soon as he finds her answer, she comes back around to the audience and connects to us, uh, which is an act of extroversion. But this activity is not entirely symmetrical. For instance, with this girl, in total, what we saw was 17 seconds of introversion and three seconds of extroversion. Uh, so this girl was oscillating between coming outward and going into herself, but the ratio was heavily skewed in retreating into herself. So in this isolated clip, we can say that the girl had a habitual and predominant display of introversion. So let's take a look at the opposite case. I'm going to play this video. Like someone, I was meeting someone yesterday, they were like, hi, I'm so-and-so. I was like, hi, I'm Dakota. And they were like, yeah, I know. And it's like, okay, well, I can't lose the fact that I still need to introduce myself to people, even though they might already know my name or who I am, you know, because I'm still just a person and I want to be able to say, hi, I'm Dakota. Oh, yeah, I guess you already do know my name, but I'm still going to say it anyway. So in this clip, we saw uh, an oscillation between introversion and extroversion, but the ratio of extroversion to introversion was 17 seconds or so of extroversion and three seconds or so of introversion. So in this isolated clip, we can say that uh, the girl had a habitual and predominant display of extroversion. Here I've put the two videos next to each other with their introversion to extroversion ratios represented below them, which is 17 to three versus three to 17. And that would be seconds. So in this example, I'm using seconds as the metric, although there are other ways which we'll talk about to measure this instead of seconds spent in either modality. But we're using this method for this introduction. So can we call it a day and say, yep, the girl on the left is introverted and the girl on the right is extroverted? Well, probably, but we can make sure and gather a bit more data. If we watched another 20 seconds, we would hope to find this 17 to 3 ratio repeated, but we may not, because uh, it's certainly possible for an extrovert to have a 20 second time frame where they're introverting, and it's also possible for an introvert to be animating for 20 seconds straight. But if we did this tally second by second for 20 minutes straight, which is, by the way, over a thousand data points, the ratio may start to look something like this. We have a ratio of something like 913 to 287 for the left side girl, uh, introversion to extroversion. And for the right side girl, you have a ratio of introversion 255 to extroversion 945. Uh, at this point, we would have a solid idea of what the ratios are, and we can expect the ratio to be re relatively unchanging after that. Uh, people sometimes ask me, well, uh, isn't the body expression variable? Uh, doesn't it change from moment to moment? And, and yes, it is a variable moment to moment due to the oscillations that we just described, but it is unvarying at the larger scale. At the larger scale, the data forms very consistent clustering. Our bodily expression follows the same principle behind uh, this diagram. Uh, it's a probability distribution graph. In this case, it shows the probability distribution of getting heads in a coin flip. And those familiar with this diagram will know that in principle, a balanced coin should come up heads at a ratio of 50-50. Uh, but if you just do 10 coin flips, uh, you might get something like seven heads and three tails. And that would seem to violate the 50-50 clause. But this is because the number of data points are too few. So if instead you did 1,000 or a million coin flips, the ratio will always even back out to 50-50. So it's, it's the same case with people's voltology. If you watch only 20 seconds, uh, then that's like doing 10 coin flips. You might not get the full picture, uh, but the longer you watch, the more stable the ratio becomes. Uh, every person on this planet has uh, an absolute ratio of introversion to extroversion that their body displays, uh, whether or not that value is known to them. So, for instance, if you had a person walking around recording you 24-7 for, for years at a time, 
and you took all that footage to average out uh, what it, what your ratio is, you would get a fixed ratio of how much introversion versus extroversion you display. But of course, it's impractical to record this much data and nobody walks around being recorded all the time. So this is not something known to us, even though we have an absolute value that we display. But the job of a voltologist is to decide on what is the minimum acceptable time needed in order to accurately approximate this absolute ratio. I personally hold to the rule of thumb that two 10 minute videos taken apart uh, when brought back together can give you around 90% accuracy in determining people's baseline voltology. You can, you can get closer to 100% accuracy if you invest more time, uh, but 20 minutes is a reasonable amount of time and that fits into the time frame of a therapeutic practice. So what you see in this diagram is the diminishing returns in accuracy that come from a reading after a certain amount of minutes. So you get the most upside in the first few minutes of analysis, and that there's the most probability of error in the first few minutes, but then after around 20 minutes, you're pretty good as far as knowing what's going on. And then after that, there's diminishing returns. So we don't wanna to get to the diminishing returns bit, but we also don't wanna have too few data points that we make a lot of errors. So that sweet spot, in my opinion, is around 20 minutes of footage. So what I might suggest practitioners and therapists to do is inform your patients that you do a voltological analysis and ask them if they'd like to have one. If so, you can set up a tripod with a camera as you guys talk it out, and then you turn it off after 20 minutes. Uh, don't try to type them as you're recording them. That's not a good idea because you need to put aside some time to do the tallying of how much the ratios are between the two things in order to get a proper result. So what I would suggest is letting the meeting go on. And then after the session is over, you can take 20 minutes or more to do a visual analysis uh, using our online tool, which helps you put in the data and exports out a report for you with the results that they have. And then you can talk about those results with them in the next meeting. Which brings us to the final part of this talk, which is discussing the results with the patient. It's easier to talk about results which align with the patient's self-understanding. So we're gonna just skip that and we're gonna focus on the misalignments. Earlier, we gave an example of two individuals who labeled themselves as introvert or extrovert Yet, according to our elementary facts of the body-mind connection, they had themselves typed backwards. As I mentioned earlier, we actually cannot leave out the subjective factor, the subjective opinion of the patient. We should never simply uh, dismiss their subjective account. Instead, uh, a therapist would do well to ask the patient to expand upon what they mean by introversion and extroversion. And in my experience, uh, there are three general things that you might discover. The first thing that it could be is that they understood the physical criteria being used for introversion and extroversion, but they have a misperception about their own degree of engagement or disengagement in life. In this case, they may just not have noticed prior to this how much they are engaged or disengaged with objects, and the video analysis can illuminate them about this fact about themselves. They may have thought that they're very sedentary, but a video analysis shows that they are rather restless for example, or perhaps they don't have a good reference frame. Maybe the patient is using their mother or father as a reference point and sees themselves as disengaged compared to their mother who may be manically engaged. So relative to the mother, the patient feels removed or withdrawn, but relative to, let's say, a thousand people, they would fall on the engaged side of the spectrum. As a side note, we have a database freely available at voltology.com data, which carries hundreds of labeled samples, which can serve as a reference for where a person might fit along the spectrum. So it, it's, it's very common that we measure ourselves in relation to our immediate family. And it's often the case that there is an ego image attached to the patient, which acts as a counterpoint to their parents. For example, if a child has a parent who embarrasses them in public often uh, because of how loud and animate they are, the child may create an ego distinction and say, 
I'm not like my mom. My mom is all over the place. She's an extrovert. I'm an introvert. And in a case like this, the category of extrovert and introvert is instrumental to the patient as a means to create a division between their ego and that of other people, especially family members. They've found a tool, a linguistic dichotomy, to help them explain something about their personal world. This, this ego differentiation is actually an important first step in the development of a person to emancipate them from their parents. And so we don't want to undermine that. We don't want to tell that specific patient that you're wrong about being an introvert. Uh, because what that translates to in their minds is your ego is flawed, your ego is wrong. And this causes damage to the ego, which leads to instability and more harm than good. Instead, what we want to do is we want to show the patient that, yes, relative to your mother or father, you are more introverted and that needs to be acknowledged. You're not wrong about that, but relative to the whole human population, uh, you still fall on this side of the line. That's something that is much better accepted. And it's something that integrates with what they've tried to use the category for in their personal lives. And so in that case, it adds to the patient's self-knowledge. It complements it rather than subtracting from it, rather than treating their self-perception as a void. Sometimes we just need to help them clarify their semantics and help them see the bigger picture which they exist within. Uh, the second possibility, and this one is also very common, is that they are applying a different definition of introversion or extroversion that they've heard. And they're using that definition on themselves. So for example, let's say that they're not a good social mixer. They don't like to be in parties and somewhere along their life journey, someone told them that an extrovert is someone who likes parties and is a good social mixer. And understandably, they don't identify with that because that's not who they are. Once again here, the ego has correctly drawn a boundary around itself and that boundary is not wrong. According to the category that they've created, they don't fit that category in their minds. Uh, so there's no need to question the boundary for what it means by its own terms. And yet, in the case of an extrovert here, uh, the physical fact remains that this person is still highly engaged with the external world, but it just happens not to be the world of people. Extroversion, by our definition, is not just about a magnetic pull towards people, but it's about a pull towards objects in general. And, and people are a special case of an object, but not the only one. Other forms of engaging with the external world might be canoeing, biking, dancing, uh, singing. Uh, socialization is just one subcategory of extroversion. And I would call that social extroversion. And so in the world of people, you will find extroverts with uh, social anxiety, for example. Uh, they'll be the sorts of people who love going outdoors, who engage with life and their environment, playing, jumping, hiking, doing things. But when it comes to people, perhaps they become stressed easily and anxious easily. And there's all sorts of reasons why a person might have social anxiety, uh, ranging from bad past experiences and trauma to insecurities about themselves to hormonal imbalances. Now, some typology models define introversion as what is essentially another name for social anxiety. Uh, we don't believe this is wise or true. Uh, so, so it is important to keep in mind that in model one, social anxiety and not being good with people, it's not the same thing as introversion. And uh, why is this distinction important? Well, from a therapeutic perspective, it's very important to distinguish native introversion from social anxiety, just as it's important for any medical expert to distinguish between two different diseases. Not doing so can lead a patient to receive false information about themselves, and that information can be misapplied to their life. To give an example, if a person with social anxiety is told, it's okay, you are an introvert, and that's just how you are, uh, this is not only misleading them, uh, but it's actually reinforcing their social anxiety uh, by giving them a rationalization for it. So if the patient feels like their social anxiety is something innate, then there's a fatalism attached to it. There's nothing that can be done about it. Perhaps deep down they'd like to engage with the world to the degree that is aligned to their physiology and their psychology naturally, 
But if they think their innate psychology is introverted, then they will not break free from that and go into their native state because they think this is their native state. And that can be problematic to the patient. So it's important to get this right and to not make mistakes on this point, uh, which leads me to the final possibility, which involves uh, practitioner error. Uh, we as practitioners or therapists can misread the signals or the voltology instrument may be misreading the patient's psychology. The voltology is a skill like any other skill, and there are degrees of competence. A well-trained voltologist will be able to identify a type correctly the majority of the time, but the error rate is not 0%, not even with perfect use. So just like with any medical test you might uh, take, there can be errors in the instrumentation, and there's limits to the instrumentation of voltology. So the therapist should keep this possibility in mind at all times and to not assert their own reality onto the patient unanimously, but instead they can engage in a dialogue with the patient about the voltological results and then come to a reconciliation with them about what their body is saying and what their subjective experience of themselves is. Find the middle ground that makes sense of both points of data. Talking about that mismatch, if there is one, uh, may be a portal into a deeper understanding of the patient's psychology. So in this sense, voltology becomes another tool in the toolbox of the therapist to equip them better to understand their patients. But as always, the therapist must apply their own listening ear to the patient and do the difficult task of balancing all the information coming together into a final analysis about the person. Hey, for those watching this video as part of a lecture course, you can click on the link below which will take you to a test you can take and test your skills to see how well you understand the difference between introversion and extroversion. I'll see you guys around.